Welcome to Canon Conversation number 818. Today is June 27th, 2022, and June 2022 is Pride Month. And I think a lot of these things, they're just doing something politically. They'll say, oh yeah, we're celebrating Pride Month. They do it for one day, and then that's it. Okay, so we did our, you know, we look good politically because we uh, recognize the LBGQXYZABC people. But not us. We're celebrating. It's not Pride Day. It's Pride Month. We're celebrating Pride the entire month. We're going to be proud. And so today, we're continuing. We've been doing it all month, and now we're continuing. We're going to celebrate Pride. We're proud today of Jesus overcoming temptations. Proud of Jesus overcoming temptation. Because if he didn't do it, he just succumbed to one temptation. Then he sinned. And if he sinned, then when he died on the cross, he would have died to pay for his own sin. So then he couldn't pay for my sin and your sin and everybody else's sin. So then he couldn't, so then none of us could be in God's eternal kingdom. Jesus would be there because he, you know, paid for his sin. But, uh, but none of us would be there. We couldn't, uh, and we wouldn't wouldn't be wouldn't have the power to sufficiently pay for us in fact Jesus wouldn't have had the power even if he just sinned once he wouldn't have had the power to overcome death so he still would have been suffering in hell never gotten out of hell but uh, so that's it's very important if Jesus overcame 99% of the temptations but fell and won then um, all of us including Jesus would be in hell none of us would be saved and so I'm proud of Jesus overcoming temptations and when I say that, that was not an easy thing to do. A lot of times we think of it in terms of, uh, well, you know, I, I, my sin nature wants me to steal, but I won't steal. Or my sin nature says to hate somebody, but I'm not going to hate them. I'm going to show God's love to them. You, you look at the Ten Commandments, the things that you shouldn't do, and then you end up, you know, saying, I'm not going to do those sins. Well, it's not that easy. It's not just not the overcoming temptations is not just the absence of uh, sinning you know not sinning uh, that was the easy stuff for Jesus <coughs> you know don't kill don't steal don't commit adultery don't covet don't lie he you know that that stuff is easy for him but I and of course I'm proud for him to overcome in that because none of us have been able to overcome that either but the real thing is we got to understand that sin is not just where you're not supposed to do something and you do it so you sin. Romans 14 23 Romans 14 23 says whatsoever is not a faith is sin and so a sin is just going against what the Father God the Father would want you to do and uh, and so it's not just you know not doing something that you're not supposed to do but it's making sure you always do what God wants you to do so first off he had to know God's Word that's why over there in Corinthians Paul tells the Corinthians God will never give you a temptation more than you can bear but will, he'll provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it and so um, Jesus had to spend his life he had daily Bible studies with the Father the book of Isaiah tells us and uh, he had to learn God's Word that's why when he came, he didn't start his earthly ministry until he was age 30. He wasn't water baptized. He didn't have the Holy Ghost entering into him. He didn't have those things until age 30. And you say, what was he doing before then? Well, he was reading God's Word every single day. He was learning everything. We're told he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. He had to learn the doctrine found in the Old Testament and then he had to make the decisions to trust God every single time and then um, and then then that way he learned obedience by and then he suffered because he uh, Satan is the God of this world the world is operating by Satan's course and he was going against the course so he was failing Satan's course and so he got persecuted by everybody including his own disciples I mean he tells he tells his disciples that he's going to have to die, be buried, and rise from the dead. And Peter says, Not so, Lord, this shall never be to you. So there's Peter. Now, Peter didn't intentionally do it, but Peter was tempting 
Jesus to sin, to not trust in what the Father told him to do. And so he says, get thee behind me, Satan. He's not calling Peter Satan. He just realizes Satan is using Peter to tempt Jesus not going to the cross. And so I'm proud that Jesus overcame temptations. A lot of times we only think of it in terms of Matthew chapter 4. So he's already, he's got his 30 years of training in. He's learned God's word. He knows every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. He knows those things. And so then he... Um, so then whenever situation, he knows how to apply it. So then Satan comes to him, Matthew chapter 4. He's tempted 40 days in the wilderness after he is baptized by John the Baptist. He receives the Holy Ghost. And uh, he is those three temptations that you see in Matthew 4. Which, by the way, it didn't happen just those three times. She, Satan did, just didn't do it three and then give up. He was tempting him the entire 40 days. And... Uh, and so you've got the, in all three cases of those temptations there in Matthew 4, Jesus says um, he doesn't succumb to it because he says it is written and he quotes scripture. In one of those temptations, Satan misquoted scripture to try to get Jesus to uh, not go to the cross, to, uh, to believe that God would give him an easy life. Basically the health and wealth gospel, he says it is written. He shall give his angels charge over thee, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. But lest at any time is not in the original. He, Satan adds that to try to get him to do that, recognizing Satan, knowing that that was for the future in the kingdom. Um, it wasn't for the suffering. He came the first time to suffer, not to, um, not to be the king, but to suffer. Because Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So he had to defeat the king of this world, Satan. Uh, defeat death and hell. And then later on, his second coming, he'd come as king. But his first time, he was coming to suffer. But uh, Satan tries to apply the second coming, the glory that should follow. Apply a verse that applies to the second coming. Apply to his first coming. So that he would believe the health and wealth gospel. Rather than believing that he needs to suffer at his first coming. And Jesus does not succumb to that. He quotes scripture. So a lot of times we think of that and say, okay, he was tempted 40 days and um, he didn't succumb to the temptation. And so then that was it. But no, that he continues to be tempted and the temptations get harder. Remember, God will not allow you to be tempted more than you can bear, but make a way of escape. Well, the more sound doctrine he gets in the inner, inner man, remember he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And really... The reason it's sort of a progressive thing where the more and more you um, use scripture to overcome temptation, then you're able to bear greater temptations to the point that when Jesus is about 33 or 33 and a half years old, then he's having to go to the cross. And that is the hardest thing ever. He, cry, he, he prays in the garden, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. I know that I'm supposed to go to the cross, but no man yet ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it. He doesn't want to go, his flesh does not want to go to the cross. He does not have a sin nature, he does not have a sinful flesh, but he still has that self-preservation thing in mind. You know, if you're about to, if you're in a dangerous situation, if someone's holding a gun to your head, you gotta do about anything you can to uh, keep them from pulling the trigger. And so Jesus, similarly, knowing that the Father wanted him to go to the cross, didn't want to do it in his flesh. And so he prays and he agonizes and he sweats, as it were, great drops of blood, saying, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But finally, in the end, knowing that this is the only way, he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So Philippians 2 says, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And it took him uh, to humble himself and become obedient. It was a very difficult thing because he had to overcome his flesh. And that's the, the hardest temptation he ever felt, but uh, had, but he overcame it. And the only reason he overcame it 
is because he overcame 33 years worth of temptations before that. He was obedient to the Father from then on, from birth. He always obeyed what the Father wanted him to do. So here is the temptation to try to self-preservation, and yet he overcomes that one, become humble himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so he, Jesus had to go through these temptations, lifetime of temptations, using scripture to overcome them. And then he became obedient in every single one to the point that he overcame the greatest temptation of all, to die on a cross for our sins. And, uh, and he did not sin in that. He did what the Father wanted him to do. He went to that cross. The victory, by the way, was won in the garden. When Jesus says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, the book of Isaiah said he set his face like a flint. He was not going to be ashamed. He was not going to be confounded. He went to the cross. His mind was made up. And it's interesting, he set his face like a flint because a flint is what's used to start a fire. And, uh, and so it's like he's, he's ready to start that fire, suffer the fires of hell by going to that cross, uh, knowing that uh, he will not be ashamed. He will overcome death because the Lord will help him. The Lord will give him the victory over death because he's uh, believing what the Father wants him to do. Uh, so he humbles himself, becomes obedient unto death. And so I am proud of Jesus overcoming temptations, culminating in the cross. But I wanted to go over some other things where the Bible specifically mentions temptations that, he's, that he faced during those three, three and a half years uh, from age 30 to the cross. And we probably don't realize these things. So I wanted to go over some of those. Uh, first one I've got is um, John 3, 16. A lot of people know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But not a lot of people know the next verse, verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. One of the greatest temptations that Jesus faced, and a lot of us probably don't even think about it, is the temptation to judge. Um, the God had said under that old covenant, which by the way they were still under, when Jesus was born on the eighth day, he was circumcised. They brought sacrifices. Uh, to the temple, just like the law says that they were to do. So they're still under the old covenant. And under that old covenant, the Levites are the priests. And not, um, Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, so he wasn't born a priest. He didn't have the right to judge according to the law because he wasn't of that tribe. Now he is of a higher order, the order of Melchizedek, and that is the judging tribe under the new covenant. So he is able, Jesus is able to judge when, uh, Israel under that new covenant. But under the old covenant, he doesn't have the fleshly qualifications. But uh, because he's of Judah and not of Levi. But he knows a lot better than the Pharisees. He knows, uh, he knows God's word and he judges fairly. Jesus told the Pharisees, uh, Matthew 23, he says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, uh, where you tithe, um, you, you, you give tithes even down to your spices, but you omit the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, faith. These you should have done and not left the other undone. So the Pharisees are not judging like they should. They're omitting the weightier matters, justice, faith, mercy. Um, and, and so God calls them, Jesus calls them out on that. But, and so Jesus knows he would have judged correctly if Jesus was in that position, he would have judged correctly. Uh, but the thing is, he's not in that position of judge. You know, I think of it sort of like, um, let's say a, a judge in tennis. I remember John McEnroe, he was always complaining and yelling because uh, he'd say they made the, the umpire made a bad call. You know, the, oh, chalk flew up on this one. It was in, it wasn't out. You said it was out, but chalk flew up, so I know it hit the line. It's in. Well, um, and you know, he was probably right, but it didn't matter because he wasn't the judge. He was the player at that point. So, uh, you know, later on, he could become a chair umpire if he wanted to. 
Uh, but it, since he's not in that position, it doesn't matter if he's right or not. It's He has no right to tell that umpire that the ball was in, even though it was in, because the umpire has the authority to judge, not John McEnroe. So you can think of Jesus like that. He's the player. He's come. God sent not his son to the world to condemn the world, not to judge it, at least the first time, but that the world through him might be saved. He was sent to bring salvation. And you know he knew the Bible, and he, and he uh, knew that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were not judging as they should have been. They were giving bad judgment. Uh, he could have, it was a great temptation then to do pull an old John McEnroe and say, what, what are you doing to these people here? That's an unfair judgment. And especially, you know, he wants to stand up for the people. He doesn't like how they're being unfairly judged. But yet, he's not in that position yet. Now, at his second coming, he will. But at his first coming, he wasn't. That was a very big temptation that most people don't think about. It wasn't the temptation to steal or kill or lie or commit adultery. The great temptation that he was facing was that Jesus was not in the position to judge at his first time, first coming, but yet he was the best judge there. He knew how to do it, and he saw multiple accounts of injustice by the judges, and yet he didn't do anything. A great example of that is the woman caught in adultery, John chapter 8. The Pharisees bring a woman to Jesus and says, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. The law says to stone her. What do you say? That was a temptation. John 8 verse 6. It says, this they said tempting him that they might have to accuse him. He's not in the position to judge at his first coming. Now, if you're going to go by the law on that, the law says that if um, a man and a woman have sex, and in this case, let's say the woman, it sounds like, is married, and she has sex with a man who is not her husband. What the law says about that is that uh, in that case, the man is to be killed. Uh, because he committed adultery. Now the woman, uh, you have to find out, well, did what's the circumstances here? If the woman was overpowered and she was raped, well then uh, you don't kill her. Um, and so the law says that if she's out there where nobody could hear her, she's out in the country, then the law says let's give her the benefit of the doubt, uh, saying that maybe she tried to get away and she couldn't. And so if she's raped out in the country there, or has sex out in the country, no one's around. Well, we don't know if she was raped or if she was, if it was consensual. So let's give her the benefit of the doubt and uh, let her go free. But if it was a consensual thing, it's in the city, people were around, she could have cried out, people would have heard her, and no one did, then she must not have cried out. Therefore, both the man and the woman are to be killed. So that's what the law says about it. <clears throat> but you notice, <coughs> that's why it says they were trying to tempt him. Because if the woman was caught in the very act of adultery, uh, then the man would have been caught in the very act of adultery as well. And the man isn't even mentioned. So really, the law in this case would say, well, you're trying to trick us. you got to get the man too. And let's judge the man and we'll judge the woman at the same time. But if you don't have the man here, then what, you know, what, what are you doing? Uh, and so, but Jesus, you know, of course, he's not in that position to judge. So what he does is he stoops down and he writes on the ground. And what he writes, we don't know, but uh, it's, a, you know, it was just that he couldn't, he wasn't in a position to judge because he's not a Levite, so he's not uh, authorized to judge in those matters. And uh, he knows it's a, a trap, it's a setup. And so he's really in a catch-22. If he starts to say anything about it, he's judging, and so then he sinned because he's not in the position to judge. And so, uh, but at the same time, he wants a fair, he doesn't want the woman to be condemned when he knows that this is a setup and where's the man in this. So he just stoops down and writes on the ground and whatever he wrote was enough to, where he wasn't actually judging, but at the same time he was, um, um, you know, but basically, 
trying to help the woman out, I think. So my opinion is he was writing down um, the events, what took place. Trying, as God, he would know those things. And so he would be there not as a judge, but as a witness. And he was writing them down on the ground. That's what I think. But anyway, you can see it's a catch-22. If he opens his mouth, he wants to help the woman out because it's a trap. But, um, but if he starts judging, then he sinned because he's not to be a judge. Other cases of temptations. Matthew 16, 1. It says that they tempted, religious leaders tempted him wanting a sign. Uh, very easy to say, you know, hey, I'm God. I could do these miracles. Let me go ahead and do this miracle. Uh, you want a sign? You got it. But um, the sign, he said, don't cast your pearls before swine. And these are swine. These are unclean people because they're unbelievers. And so at that point, since they've already rejected him as the Messiah, attributing his works to the works of Beelzebub, to Satan, then um, he couldn't give the sign. It would have been a sin for him to give the sign. Matthew 19, 3, they tempted him coming up with this Sadducees asking, is it lawful to put away a woman, a wife for any cause? Again, it's just a matter of the law and trying to say, well, you know, God said in the beginning not to do these things, but because of the hardness of your hearts, God allowed divorce. So it was a very tough situation. All right, anyway, we're out of time. Thanks for watching.